Great. Well, we're a little bit early. We're five minutes um, ahead of time. So hopefully, um, Hazel uh, Napier from BB Consultancy, that you're uh, there. You're going to be talking about cash flow and reduce five simple steps to reducing risk. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty <laughs> excited about hearing what you have to say. So uh, good to see you again. Anyway, I haven't seen you. Yeah. Um, I'll leave you to it if you want to share your screen and I'll stay just for a moment, make sure that all that works. Is. Okay. There we go. See you, pro. Yeah. You're, you're used to this experience. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks um, so yeah, great to be here with you today. I love coming to these because um, I learned so much. I mean, I have no idea all that stuff about foxes, but there we go. Um, so yeah, my topic is a bit more around uh, business and making sure that you've got cash in your pockets at the end of the day. So I'm going to do a quick um, introduction about what it is that we do. And then, as I say, we're going to be talking about cash flow and various ways you can protect your business. Um, and as Nick said, there's a there'll time, be time for a Q&A at the end. So do feel free to pop questions in the um, Q&A section and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. So just a very quick intro about us. So um, we've been going since 2008. Um, it was our 15th year this year. So we did go for a few drinks, which was nice. And um, we've a team of seven based in Northampton, but we've got clients throughout the UK. Um, and basically we do what it says on the tin. So contract and legal services. We basically write all types of business contracts, terms and conditions, subcontractor agreements, and we review contracts that our clients get sent as well. So the first thing, step one, um, it sounds really simple, but it's get your paperwork right. Um, so it's, it does sound simple, but it's something that so many businesses get wrong. So the first one I wanted to address is basically your quotes. And when I say quotes, I know a lot of you will be doing call outs, emergency work. So when I say quote, it could just be as simple as a text message or an, uh, an email with a price, whatever it might be. But when, when we're talking about quotes, so basically you need to make sure in your email signature and on that quotation paperwork, if there is something more formal, you're including your full company name, your registered number and your registered office address if you're a limited company. And if you're a sole trader, you need your name, trading name and address on there. So just somewhere so that customers know who they're dealing with and how they can get hold of you. And you also have to include your VAT number if you're registered. So they're the legalities, but how to make sure you get paid on time. And um, so basically, again, it's something that we see get forgotten a lot, which is to make sure you include in your quote a quotation date and more crucially, an expiry date. So people often forget about the expiry date, but it's so important to make sure because if you think, you know, materials prices are increasing all the time, if you use labour, costs are going up all the time. So you need to make sure that you've got an end date on that quote so that if you if you need to uh, change your price, you've got that option. And it could be uh, five days, it could be 30 days, it could be three months, whatever you think is relevant to um, your service. And I'd think about when you're working out what your expiry date is going to be, think about how often your suppliers are increasing their prices and sort of tie it in with that. But you're better off having a short period of time for the expiry because then you can decide that you want to you're happy to extend that quote, but you can't you can't go the other way. Um, another thing to include on there, again, sounds daft, but your contact details and always I'd always include your bank details on your quote if you can. So you want to make it as easy as possible for your customers to pay you. Um, and especially if you're asking for payment up front, and I'll come on to payment terms shortly. And the other thing you need to include on your quotes is a reference to your terms and conditions. So um, I'll explain a, more, a bit more about how contracts are actually formed, but essentially for a contract to um, include your T's and Z's, you have to reference it at the point the contract is formed. So that's essentially with your quote. So all you need to do is basically say, this quote is subject to our terms and conditions, and then either send a copy alongside or say copies on request whatever really works for you. Um, and then the next one is obviously invoices. So the same information as for your quote. So if you're a limited company, your company name, registered address and so on. But you also have to include on there an invoice date and a due date. So again, we get so many invoices come through our business where there's no due date. And what's going to happen, especially if you're working with commercial customers, is they're going to assume it's 30 days and you'll, you'll get put to the back of the pile. So when I'm talking about um, cash flow, getting money in, you, you essentially want to make, sh make sure that you're the top of the pile um, of, of people's invoices to pay. Um, and again, on your uh, invoices, include your bank details. So make it easy, make it as simple as possible for your customers to pay you. Some accounts software allows you to add a payment link on there so you can they can make payment by card. Just as, as I say, make it as easy as possible for, for customers to pay you. And then just a little bit about your website. So you need all the same contact information on there from a legal point of view. You need, a, you need an address on there. 
Um, you also need to, uh, you should ideally state that you're members of the PPCA and list any other associations you're part of so that customers know what they can do if they're unhappy with the service. And you also legally have to have a privacy policy on there. So if your website collects data, and almost all of them will, whether that's just through a contact form or whether it's through cookies that collect data in the background, you have to make sure that you've got a privacy policy on there that says, tells people what you're doing with their data. That's just from a legal point of view. So next up, we've got payment terms, and this is a biggie. So um, obviously, cash flow is king. Um, if you're not getting paid on time, you can't pay your suppliers, you can't pay your staff, you can't pay yourself, and your business will close. It doesn't matter if you've got a whole bank of um, jobs that are likely to come through the door. If you've not got cash in your bank, you can't pay, and that's that's why businesses fail. It's actually the most common reason for businesses failing. So what can you do? Well, get your processes in order, and that really starts with your payment terms. So I'm going to be banging the drum about terms and conditions, but if you do nothing else, if you forget about T's and C's altogether, really just state your payment terms as clearly as, as possible in any pre-contract um, conversations with customers so in your quote reiterate your payment terms do you want a deposit do you take payment in advance in full do you want payment within seven days make sure that they're aware of it and again um, in your quote and um, so quote an invoice and stick to those payment terms and I would urge you to think how much you can reasonably take up front as a deposit because basically if you've got it in your pocket you can refund it but if you've not got it you're always going to struggle to get it so a lot of people set up in business, they choose 30 day payments as standard. They just think that's what everybody does. But you don't have to let um, your competitors or your customers dictate your payment terms. You can choose what your payment terms are going to be. So I can tell you that our payment terms as a business, we take payment in full up front and nobody questions it. I know it's slightly different in what we do, but it's still a service business and we can't undeliver the service once we've delivered it. And it's the same for you guys. You can't put the pests back. So think about how much your costs are and in an ideal world cover those costs through a deposit so that you've got that you know you can you can again you can be the nice guy you can refund it but if you've been paid it you're going to find it a whole lot easier uh, later down the line it just saves you so much time and effort um, in chasing money that you're probably not going to get and i'll explain a bit more about cancellations shortly so then the inevitable some people were are just going to be a pain people do pay late uh, for various reasons um, so again what can you do so step three is to chase those payments in sounds daft but have a written process for chasing your payments and stick to it so make sure that your whole team knows what your payment uh, terms are and what your process is for chasing those payments so that they don't do something beyond that so your process might just be as simple as you email the customer after five days and just let them know that their invoice is late. Then perhaps you give them a call after 10 days. And I'd say don't ever underestimate the power of a call because it's a lot easier to ignore an email and just delete an email than to speak to someone and say why you've not paid them. Um, and then I would always recommend stopping work after a certain period of time. Um, so if you've not been paid an invoice and you're due to go back again, um, you, you ought to really withhold that next service until you've been paid for the first one um, but this is all stuff that ought to go into your terms and conditions um, and obviously you might have done all of the above and still no payment um, so then what can you do so there's a couple of things you can follow so you've got a statutory right so a legal right to charge interest how that works is you've got the right to charge eight percent per annum above the bank of england base rate and i've lost track of the bank of england base rate but it's five point something i think <laughs> so actually eight percent on top of that turned into a bit of a chunky amount. Um, it's worth noting that it's calculated annually. So actually, if you've got a small invoice, it's probably going to be quite a small figure in interest that actually gets calculated. But all you need to do is tell the customer, do you know what, you're 30 days late in paying this invoice, I'm going to start charging you interest. And just the fact that you're aware of that and you tell them that, you're more likely to get paid. I wouldn't necessarily go through the process of working out how much, you know, the £2.50 that you're owed in interest, just tell them you're going to start charging interest as per your T's and Z's, um, and then hopefully you'll go to the top of the pile. And beyond that, what you can do next is you can send what's called a letter before action. So basically telling them that you're, you're going to start proceedings against them. I know people are reluctant to chase money, especially if it's 50 quid, 100 quid, they just write it off. But if you're actually owed it and you've got evidence to prove that you're owed it, I'd just say go for it. <laughs> you've got nothing to lose, especially start with the letter before action reiterate about the interest it's with it's within your rights 
The next stage you can do is just a super simple, it's called a money claim online. It's just through the government portal. Um, it's designed for you to be able to recover money yourself. So it's, it's really simple. It's just basically filling out a form um, for any money, any debt claim that's under £10,000. And as I say, don't be afraid to chase it if you're genuinely owed it. Um, you might, so what happens then is uh, the debtor, so your customer will get sent a notice that you've done that. Then they've got 14 days to respond to it, or they can ask for an extra 14 days. And then you might get an automatic judgment against them, in which case, you know, it's happy days. You do still have to enforce the judgment. So there's, I know it's a bit of a faff, but um, it's, it's your money. It, you should be paid it. Um, I'd reiterate really the importance of keeping everything in writing. So a written evidence of all the communication between you. So every time you sent that chaser, every time um, you phoned the customer to chase it, um, evidence of the contract between you, and then um, you've got it all in the bag should you need it. But have a written process. Start with just saying that you're going to start charging interest and see how far you want to take it. But as I say, so many people end up writing off these debts and it's not fair because it's your money at the end of the day. So step four is dealing with problems quickly. And really the key word there is quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a few scenarios. So cancellations, this is the first one. So perhaps you've quoted a really big project. You've won the job. You're super happy. You've perhaps stopped quoting for other jobs so that you can fulfill that order. Uh, maybe you've even taken on extra staff or taken on some subcontractors to fulfill it. So basically you've incurred costs and you've stopped selling. And then the customer cancels at the last minute. What are you going to do? Um, firstly, it's really important to point out to you about the importance of the cooling off period. So this is for domestic customers only. So only when you're working with consumer customers, you have to offer them a 14 day cooling off period within which they can cancel for any reason um, if they just change their mind. So this is if the contract is formed away from your premises. If you've got a shop or a pre actual premises and they come in to book the job in your premises, it doesn't apply. They're for everybody else. Um, if the job is formed away, whether it's on the phone or however, um, they, they have a 14 day cooling off period in which they can cancel. It was basically brought about because if you remember back in the 90s, those dodgy doorstep salespeople, grey suits, there'd be uh, knocking on doors, selling conservatories to old ladies that live in flats. So it's basically to try and get away from that, to give consumers more rights. And you have to tell them about these rights. You have to offer them and you have to tell them about those rights. And in fact, um, trading standards can investigate if you don't follow this procedure. And also consumers get entitled to additional rights if you don't tell them about their rights, which sounds a bit crazy. Um, but there are cases where um, a business hasn't told the consumer about their 14 day cooling off period. Perhaps there's been an issue that's gone to court and the judge has ruled that because they didn't tell them about it, the consumer is then entitled to a year and 14 days in which you cancel. So it's very unlikely that you're going to win. Just bear in mind that when you are working with domestic customers, generally they are more likely to win if there's an issue so just try and resolve that situation as quickly as you possibly can you've obviously got the bpca code of conduct that you need to follow um, regardless but you just want to make sure that you're maintaining that reputation um business to business so when you're working with uh commercial industrial customers it's very different um you can say they have no right to cancel and you'd need to specify that in the terms and conditions. And again, make sure that they're aware of that at the time the quote is, uh, is uh, accepted. Um, but businesses, you can be a lot harsher because ultimately they're deemed to have the same bargaining power as you as another business. Um, so you can think about how you want to structure your cancellations. Do you want a certain amount of notice before you before you were due to turn up? Um, but just make sure that, again, you've cover your, covered your costs at the very least and you've got sufficient notice to find another job to fill that um, gap. And you might come across the word termination, which is often used alongside cancellation. So cancelling is generally for one-off jobs. Termination is generally for ongoing work, so service and maintenance contracts. So if you're offering retainers to customers, um, think about whether there's a minimum term that you want to tie them in for, say 12 months. And then think about the cancellation period within that. So we see a lot of... Um, ongoing retainer contracts where it says, for example, it's a 12 month minimum term. But then if you read the cancellation clause, it says customers can cancel at any time by giving three months notice. Well, if you think about it, then it's not a 12 month minimum term. It's actually a three month rolling contract. So just bear in mind, if you are tying people into a minimum term, think about whether you want to enforce that and you have to structure the, the contract accordingly. And then some other things that might crop up. 
So things like access, supportive visits. So imagine a customer's booked you to go along to their property, you've agreed a date and time, and then when you get there, there's no one there. Or perhaps you ring and they say, oh, sorry, I forgot, I'll be back in an hour. Do you mind hanging around? Or perhaps you're working around other, other trades or other businesses and they're kind of always in the way or they're moving your stuff. Or perhaps the customer's decided they're going to order the equipment or the materials that you need. And when you get there, it's either not there or it's the wrong stuff. So really, I'd just say here, value your time. So again, you're a service industry, value that time. You might have turned down other work to get that job and imagine what that other work could have led to. So it's really important to know um, that you've covered your costs again. This is where the deposits really come into their own because if you've had a wasted visit and you've taken a deposit, you can take the time off of that deposit and refund the balance. If you've not been paid a deposit, I swear you're never gonna get paid for that wasted time regardless of whether you invoice and chase. Um, consider as well within that wasted time any, exp any expenses so if you've ordered materials or equipment um, and mileage. I mean, it's getting more expensive by the day. So just factor that in and make sure that you're valuing your own time. And then another thing I thought perhaps crops up, change into the spec. So you've sent your quote um, explaining what it is that you're going to do. But when you get to the job, the customer says, oh, while you're here, could you also just <laughs> that famous, could you just while you're here? And um, so that's why it's really important to be specific in your quote. And again, when I'm talking about quote, it, it can be as simple as just an email, but put as much detail in there about what it is that you're doing and what you're not doing so that it's really clear if the specification changes. And if it does change, I would urge you to stop work, re-quote. So again, you know, you could ring the customer while you're there and say, actually, I found this, you want me to do it? You, they say yes. Um, get an email, just email them and say, just as discussed, and then you've got something in writing that you can fall back on. So just a few ideas for you there. And then we've got step five is about equipment. So obviously in your line of work, um, it's gonna be the case that you need to leave equipment on site. So bait stations and the like. Um, what you need to do is make sure in your contract that it's super clear who owns them and at what point. So ideally, you should be retaining ownership until you've been paid in full for your work. And um, how risk it, so it's called title and risk in law. And how it actually works in practice is if something is, if there's equipment that's fixed down, and by fixed, I just mean it could be a nail or a, a screw, it could be that's fixed. So if, um, if you then weren't paid and you wanted to recover those that equipment you'd have to unscrew and you'd create a hole that's actually illegal you're not allowed to do that whereas if something is sat on the ground or propped up and it's not actually fixed down if you if you've not been paid you're you're fully within your rights to go back and get that equipment but really in the contract again you need to make sure that the customer is the one that's responsible for protecting and ensuring the materials and equipment so that if it gets lost or damaged um, and it's not your fault then you can you can charge for that. Always think about um, things that could go wrong and try and write that into your T's and C's to make it chargeable so that you can recover your costs at the very least. And then I've really been banging the drum about terms and conditions, haven't I? So I'll explain why, um, why I think they're so important. So we often find business owners are scared of the idea of a contract, but actually if you break it down, it's super simple. And really, uh, what I, I'm a huge advocate of terms and conditions because all you need to do is send your quote, reference your terms and conditions. Once the customer accepts your quote, they're accepting your T's and C's and that is the contract. So I think a lot of people, when they think of the word contract, they think of quite a long, complicated legal document with notwithstandings and house of forths, um, just you know, a 20 page thing with a signature at the end when, when in fact it can be as simple as that. So if you think um, every time you fill your car with petrol, every time you order something online, you're entering into, entering into a contract. There's no need for a signature as long as you've got the process correct. So I would always advocate doing that set, you know, get the quote, reference your T's and C's, that forms the contract between you and it's just super simple. And really the best way to write them, and you can absolutely write them yourselves, and I'd, I'd really recommend that, rather than download a random template that you found online or steal a competitor's because you don't, you don't know where they came from in the first place, you can absolutely sit down and write them yourselves. And it would just be, um, in an ideal, I, I mean, I'd always say, go back and think about who's the worst customer you've ever dealt with and work back from there, because basically you want to stop that from ever happening again. And just write a simple set, Always include your payment terms, always include about cancellations. And as I say, think about what's what's happened to your business in the past and work back from there. 
be harsh because you can choose to override your terms. So for example, if you um, if you always insist on payment within seven days, that's what it would say in your T's and C's. But if you wanted to work with a large business and they said, I'll only pay you within 30, you can be the nice guy and say, that's fine. I'm happy to override my T's and C's in this, you know, that clause in my terms and conditions and you can be the nice one but it's harder to go the other way. So it's harder if it says 30 days to then try and get seven day payment. Um, and I'd really suggest writing your terms and conditions in as plain English as you possibly can, because the whole idea about them is that everyone understands what they're entering into. And so there shouldn't be a dispute because they all know what they've agreed at the outset. Just a word of warning for people that do work with uh, commercial customers, businesses, and um, beware of purchase orders. So what happens in that situation generally is you send your quote, it's subject to your terms, you receive a purchase order back and everybody's happy. Well, in fact, actually somewhere, in, I guarantee in teeny tiny writing in the footer or on the back or somewhere, it will say this purchase order is subject to our terms, in which case it's on the customer's terms. Um, and that just means that they've, they've subjected you to their standard purchase terms, which apply to you as pest controllers, as well as their stationary provider, their accountant, everyone that agrees to their purchase terms. So it's completely irrelevant to your service. So I would say in that situation, all you need to do is acknowledge the order. So go back and say, thank you so much for the order, just to confirm it's on my terms. And then it's basically whoever says it last wins, which sounds a bit mad, but you don't obviously want to enter into a never ending cycle. What happens then is if you can't agree something, you tend to come together and form a document that you're both happy with based on both sets of terms. Um, and then just quick, uh, conversation around service contracts um so similar to t's and z's but for ongoing work so i'd just say really um agree service levels at the beginning so agree how quickly you could attend a call out and be pessimistic so really think about how much time it might take you to get to a certain level um you know a certain job and and you can always beat it but try to uh be pessimistic and, and think the worst case scenario I spoke about termination earlier. So if you've got a minimum term in your contract, you need to make sure that your cancellation terms mirror that minimum term. Otherwise, basically, there is no minimum term. And then again, just a quick one about subcontractors, because this is something that we see uh, go wrong time and time again. So people that use subcontract labour, they often don't realise that there's a contractual risk there. So it's you've probably heard cases in the news like Pimlico Plumbers and Uber, and I think Amazon delivery drivers are going through the process where ultimately they've decided that they want to be considered an employee. So HMRC will consider um, their, their working relationship with the business. And if they do get deemed to be an employee, then the business then has to go back and pay them sick pay, holiday pay for all the years that they were employed. So there is obviously a tax risk, but more than that, I would say, there's also a business risk to you when you use subcontractors because the, the customer doesn't have a direct contractual route to the subby. So if the subcontractor does a terrible job on site, you you, this, the customer will sue you and you need some sort of back-to-back -back arrangement with the subcontractor so you can make them rectify the work. Um, so it's things around, as I say, rectifying poor work, who owns materials, are they collecting materials for you from suppliers, can they just then run off into the sunset? Things around data protection, they're obviously holding your customer's data, what are they doing with it? Things around your intellectual property, your reports and so on. And can they cut you out of the equation? So we hear a lot of um, people that use subcontractors, then they hear that the subby has gone and cut them out and gone to work directly for the customer because they're not back registered, for example. So just a few things to think about there if you do use subbies. Um, and then anything else so we can help with any contracts that you might need. So privacy policies, whatever it is, anything that isn't employment related. Um, and we can also review contracts that you get sent. So um, as a business owner, it's worth noting that you're deemed to know what you're entering into. You can't just say if you get sent a contract, you can't just say, oh, I didn't read it. I didn't have time. or I didn't understand it. So for people that haven't got the time or inclination, it's always worth it. You must read every page because um, if you don't, you're deemed you're you're in that contract regardless. You can't just say. Um, you're a business, you were busy, you didn't read it. So um, it's always worth noting that when you're entering into contracts. Um, and this is how we work. So we've got fixed price packages for document drafting. I'd also like to tell anyone that doesn't know, we did create in conjunction with the BPCA, there's a template version of some very simple terms and conditions for, for members that just work with consumers. So just do domestic work. There's a one page set of terms and conditions on the member area. 
Um, I'd say it's a starting point. It's not ideal because it's generic and all the terms and conditions should be bespoke to your business, but it's a good starting point. So have a look at those. If you've not got any T's and C's in place, it will hopefully give you some ideas. It's got in there cancellations, payment terms and so on. Um, but also if you want bespoke contracts drafted, we've got a 10% member discount for BPCA members. And those are my contact details. And that's it from me. There we go. I'll meet myself. Blimey, look, finding that button. <laughs> um, that was really great. We've had loads of comments there saying that, you know, really fantastic advice and um, appreciate it. And there's a few bits in the chat section with people, again, I have got some Q&As, but just before I forget and I don't have to scroll too much, there's a few people asking about templates uh, and documents, but how do they get in touch with you to get more info? Because obviously it's not through BBCA, it's through, through yourselves, it's just a member benefit we offer. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So our contact details are on the member area, I believe, um, but you can, I'll put my, I'll send the slides through as well, you can forward those on and they've got my email address on there. I mean, if you wanted to pop your contact details yeah. in the chat section, you can do that. I mean, yeah. you know, now or when or when we're done, that's absolutely cool. um, fine. A few people are sticking their own emails in there. I mean, it's fine if you want to do that, but there's <laughs> a few people in here, and uh, some of you that are putting your emails in there, you might get some, <laughs> some random data but... protection nightmare. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. So yeah, if you if you don't mind sharing those details, yeah. I know you have had a screen there, but uh, they probably didn't have time to take them down um great we've got four questions let's have a little look so phil says what's the best payment terms 14 or 28 days um i'll say why why are you asking 14 or 28 um it's really what um works for your business and i would say think about matching it with your supplier terms so if you're paying every supplier within seven days 14 days 30 days make sure that you're getting payment well before that um, you can make it anything. You can make it payment on receipt. Although I often think um, when I receive a, an invoice for my business and it's payment on receipt, I'm like, yeah, I'll probably put that seven days or something. Um, so you probably want to make it realistic, but you, you're certainly well within your rights to make it seven days, 14 days, whatever works for you. But just make sure that you're sticking to that. And then, yeah, have a think about what, what matches your supplier terms. Great. Fabulous. Um, Terry here has mentioned always to get your first quarter up front before any setup. Is that yeah, question? yeah, yeah? I mean, as I said, as much as you can get in your pocket beforehand, you can always refund it, but you're never going to get it. So just as much as you can ask for in advance, the first quarter in advance is a great, um, great advice. Whatever you can take, whatever you reasonably think is fair. As I say, it's not to say that you're going to screw the customer over and run off. Um, it's just that it's giving you protection, and then you can refund it if you can't fulfil the service or whatever. That yeah. you'll never get paid it otherwise <laughs> that's it yeah it's a complicated world isn't it this whole <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah um contracts i mean martin is uh, martin belcher he said um fantastic advice but he's also said service agreement always sounds more friendlier than contract um, yeah absolutely right so there's a lot of words for it so you can call it a customer contract a customer agreement an agreement uh, terms and conditions whatever they're basically all the same thing but whatever makes whatever sounds friendliest you're absolutely yeah. right it does have an impact on how the customer will review that so yeah service agreement whatever you want to call it really yeah i think yeah i think especially if I don't know if you're doing domestic work and you have some sort of terms and conditions or SLAs or servers, it's better than contracts, isn't it? For all, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's that word. I don't know what it is, honestly. It's just, yeah, got weird connotations. We, we exactly. We're sensitive to certain words. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's all that was in the q and I'm just scrolling up. So I'm sure I saw a question in the chat section that someone put in there. Uh, uh, is there a standard terms and conditions that are watertight? Um... Oh, that's a difficult question. Yeah, come, um, on, mate. That's it. come on, I'm relying on this. Do it. <laughs> I mean, if we've written them, then they're going to be pretty damn good. But um, I'd say try. I, I'm, I'm, I really don't like the idea of templates. So the template on the BPCA website is great because, as I say, it's a starting point. We created it. It's really great if you haven't got anything. It's just for domestic customers. It's got a huge list of caveats at the start to explain how to use it. But try and tweak it so that it suits your business. Don't just, you know, implement that straight off. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I'm, I really hate templates that you find online, um, competitors' contracts. You don't know where they came from in the first place. So they could be subject to all sorts of intellectual property restrictions, but they also might just be a load of rubbish. So so don't just assume that someone's had it professionally done. Um, try try The best thing you could do is write it yourself. So sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and say, this is what's happened to me in the past. What do I want to not happen again in the future? And structure yeah. it that way. And um, you're far better off doing that than just finding a random template online. Yeah, 
No, absolutely. Um, so, so, yeah, there's lots of people asking about templates. So, yeah, when you get your, your details in there, I'm sure they'll be getting in touch with you and then you can you can take it from there. We, we yeah, got, lovely. Yeah, we've got a lot of documents and templates for members, but not really around contracts and things yeah like there's a very you know there's lots of legal connotations to all of that so we yeah yeah but... um, I mean ultimately you're all pest controllers but you all do things differently so you offer different services in a different way so that's why it's hard to say um a template is going to be that water type because it's got to match what you do what your business is what your processes are yeah great yeah. um all oh, my colleagues just put a little link in the chat section um to advice documents and codes and apparently there's, there's a few bits in there but yeah when it comes to contracts it's a bit it's a bit limited isn't it so mm -hmm. yeah between you and i will we'll help everybody that um of course if you're a member if you're not a member then well, join oh, us. yeah yeah absolutely well worth it for the templates alone <laughs> yeah exactly it's like or just the entertainment of uh, chatting to me every now and then. <laughs> you know that's what happens of course <laughs> great great fox chat as well i'm loving the fox chat <laughs> indeed that's it the fox chat i know apparently someone put a question in there i saw in the chat section they went oh i think natalie missed that joke about the cat <laughs> I, I don't know what i missed but if i did hopefully it made you all giggle um but i'm going to be going back on it and figuring out what i missed um so no it was good i uh, hope you stick around with us and hear about yeah. dogs and spis and stuff it's absolutely great. exactly great thanks so much hazel no worries oh hazel actually oh, hang on yeah we might have two more questions that have popped up uh yeah. So, um, so Mohammed's asked a company. A company owes him money from last year. Um, he was working as a subcontractor. There's not much information. Mm -hmm. to that question, actually, I'm not sure. Can you see? Um, in yeah, there? yeah, yeah. Um, I would say so. With people that owe you money, chase it as quickly as possible. The longer it goes, the less likely you are to get paid. Um, you can always look up so if they're a limited company you can look on company's house and see if they're in trouble so some people are you know I, I heard another main contractor who went bust yesterday and um, so you can see whether they're in administration or liquidation in which case I'm afraid there's just not, not much you can do about it but get someone external get a third party we can write a letter for you sometimes just a third party writing a letter on legal headed paper Mm -hmm. freaks them out and again puts you to the top of the pile but it's worth checking whether they're still solvent or not before you waste any money on it yeah absolutely yeah. good advice um there's another one actually popped up so have you ever done contracts with biohazard cleanups linked with pest control we've done contracts for everything you could possibly imagine and really? things you probably couldn't imagine <laughs> yes yeah. So, yeah. Oh, i'm actually about what i thought they would be but <laughs> we do have time as well <laughs> We've uh, so the weirdest one we did contracts for um, a website that does cow insemination. Oh, okay. So it's like a Tinder for cows. You can swipe left or right. <laughs> I wish I was joking. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, the weirder the better. So yeah, throw anything at us. <laughs> makes an interesting view, I guess, as well because yeah. it's, you know it kind of yeah it makes things a bit a bit different. But yeah, Tinder for Definitely. cows. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you make me giggle for most of the day now. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, fabulous. So that's all the questions in there hazel amazing thank you so much as as usual and again put your contact details in chat if uh, if you want people to get in touch will do all right thanks so much thanks hazel thank Bye. you